All right, so this is the second of the flip series for Chapter 4, and the images we're looking at this time are visible images of God's invisible grace. And again, our objectives are to identify several images of the church, describe one in detail and explain its symbolism, propose your, it should be your, not your, you own, your own image of the church, and create a voice thread that shows your mastery of the objectives. So these are all visible signs of God's grace. Because one of the things about the church, and the reason why these symbols are so important, is the church is both um, in the world, but it's, it has an in-the-world visible reality, but it's both visible and invisible. So you, the church ultimately is a mystery. And it's part of history, yet it transcends history. It's, um, you know, made up of the people who we can see and talk to, as well as all the communion of saints who are with God in heaven. So the reality of the church is this um, both visible and invisible reality. And the church itself is like a sacrament of God's salvation in the world. You can't see salvation. So the church is the physical manifestation of God's saving grace in the world. So... Here are some of the images of the church that are sort of visible images we can see um, or touch, but they reflect the reality of the church as a sacrament of God's salvation. And I realize this is this should be field. So one of the images your book uh, talked about was a field, and I found this great quote from the Catechism. So um, you know this they brought this up in your book on a. I believe it's on page 51 where you see the stuff about the Ark of Noah. But from the Catechism it says, The church is a cultivated field, the tillage of God. On that land the ancient olive tree grows, whose holy roots were the prophets, and in which uh, the rec uh, reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles has been brought about and will be brought about again. That land, like a choice vineyard, so this is bringing in the vine and the branches imagery too, has been planted by the heavenly cultivator, yet the true vine is Christ who gives life and fullness to the branches, and it is us who through the church, and that's important, through the church, remain in Christ, without whom we can do nothing. So this is the idea that, um, you can also think, look at the parable of the sower. You know, parable of the sower. The idea that we are planted, um, we are, the church is this like, uh, field that God planted, and we will bear much fruit um, if we're faithful. And so that they brought in the imagery from the vine and the branches um, from John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the vine, and God is the vine grower, and we are the branches. So God will prune those branches that don't grow fruit, but if we want to grow fruit, we have to remain on the vine. So Jesus is the vine, and if we want to grow, bear fruit, which basically means have good lives, you know, Jesus is the vine, and we're the branches. So we have to stay on the vine. We have to stay with Jesus so that we can bear much fruit. So this is an image Jesus uses for himself, and then the church up here reflects on it and says, you know, continuing in this image, we are. We have to stay with Jesus in the church in order to continue to bear fruit. Um, the Ark of Noah. I think this is spelled wrong too. I'm noticing all my misspellings now. The Ark of Noah was talked about as a symbol for the church. This is obviously an Old Testament image, but I've actually seen the symbols used a lot in um, Protestant churches. A church down the street from me is shaped like an ark because it's the idea that the church is supposed to give us safe harbor through a difficult world, just like the ark gave safety to all the people on it when God flooded the earth. So that's a symbol of the idea of the church being a safe place for us and providing us with safety. Uh, the Temple of Living Stones and Temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, for the early Christians, remember, they would have gone to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, but it was destroyed in the year 70. So the temple is destroyed in the year 70, so the early Christians began to see the church as the new temple. So they started using language that described the church as a new temple. So here in the letter of 1 Peter, he writes, um, 
come to him a living stone rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God, like living stones. So we are the living stones that build God's new temple. Let yourselves be built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So these are the stones of the, the temple in Jerusalem after it was destroyed. And here Peter says, and we're going to get to talk um, similar language in uh, Paul's Corinthians and Romans where we're supposed to be the body of Christ. Here, the church is literally us. It's being built up living stones. We are the church. You know, and, you know, here's me, and here's you, and here's Sophia, and Catherine. We are the living stones of the church. And we are going to be this spiritual house, this symbol of God's action in our lives and in the world. Um, Temple of the Holy Spirit is another metaphor for the church. Um, not only is the church the temple of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit came upon the church um, at Pentecost, but also each one of us is an individual temple of the Holy Spirit. Here's Paul's quote, Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been purchased at a price. That's the idea of Christ ransoming us. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So what we see here is oftentimes the church is not identified as the leadership or as the place. In both of these references, the church is us. So we see that the early Christians made a strong connection between um, the church not being a place, not being... Um, a physical reality, but the church is us in how we live our lives. And we'll see that in Paul's um, passage from Corinthians as well. 